Now, we begin a special series on free speech with the Oxford academic and author on the subject, Timothy Garton-Ash. I love free speech. It's the oxygen of freedom, the air that enables all other freedoms to breathe. That's why I've spent the last ten years writing a book about it and running a website to promote a global online conversation in 13 different languages. Unthinkable before the internet transformed our possibilities. But what exactly makes free speech so vital? I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. Nina Simone says it better than I ever could, with the warmth and melancholy of that wonderful voice, itself a musical embodiment of freedom of expression. Free speech is essential for self-expression. Without it, we can't fully be ourselves. Her words are as profound as they are simple. I wish you could know what it means to be me. Then you'd see and agree that every man should be free. Exactly so. Free speech is a human right for both the speaker and the listener. Unless I can express myself, you can't know what it means to be me, and I can't know what it means to be you. Nina Simone, who grew up as a black child in the segregated racist American South before the triumph of the civil rights movement, knew that better than most. How can we live together well in an increasingly diverse, connected world, unless I know where you're coming from? So free speech helps us to live with diversity. We also need free speech for good government, How can we make wise policy choices if we don't possess all the facts and hear the alternatives? And there's another vital argument. It helps us seek the truth. In his great 17th century polemic against censorship, John Milton wrote, Though all the winds of doctrine were let loose to play upon the earth, so truth be in the field. Let her and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worse? in a free and open encounter. Sobered by a century of totalitarian lies and by spin doctors who mislead us with dodgy dossiers, we may no longer share Milton's magnificent confidence in the victory of truth with a capital T. But free speech remains essential to the search for knowledge. These are classic, time-honoured arguments, and none the worse for that, but they must now be applied in extraordinary new circumstances. For the combination of mass migration and the internet means that we are all neighbours now. In a city like London, you live alongside people from every country, culture and faith. And if you don't encounter them on the tube, you'll see them on YouTube. Earlier this year, I visited a refugee reception centre in Berlin, Most of the refugees had only the few possessions they could carry on their perilous journeys from Syria, Iraq or Afghanistan, but all of them had smartphones. There are an estimated three billion smartphones in use across the planet, and soon they will be used by half of humankind. This brings unprecedented opportunities for free speech. It also brings unprecedented dangers. Someone in Southern California posts a YouTube video called Innocence of Muslims, which crudely mocks the Prophet Muhammad, and people die during protests in Pakistan and Afghanistan. In theory, you can communicate with an incredible range of people. In practice, many Internet users seek out like-minded people who reinforce their own prejudices with a powerful echo chamber effect. This is how some Islamist terrorists have been radicalised online, but also Islam haters like the Norwegian mass murderer Anders Bering Breivik, who obsessively visited a handful of anti-Islam websites before going out to kill innocent teenagers on a Norwegian island. I discussed this problem on a Skype call with Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web and a passionate advocate of an open internet for everyone. 
he came up with an interesting suggestion. Now, the idea of a stretch friend. Software tends to suggest to us friends which are mathematically calculated to be very close. They're friends of friends already. When we go to a party, it's great because we meet all the same people. So, so a stretch friend is, you know, the system could throw up every now and again, say, go and talk to a Muslim, go and talk to somebody who differs from you by one dimension. Maybe they're very, very similar to you, but they are of a different religion. But, but they speak Chinese, learn some Chinese. So I think when we look at the web, the question is, is it helping us to humanity as a whole? There's another novel feature of this connected world. The extraordinary power wielded by information giants such as Google, Facebook, Apple and Twitter. I call them private superpowers. Facebook, for example, has over 1.5 billion regular users more people than China. As Facebook's Monica Bickett explains, she and her team unilaterally decide what this vast population may or may not see. It is very much a decision that we make thoughtfully with a full team of people at Facebook. And frankly, it's not just my team. I have human rights lawyers and business lawyers and people who have worked in the NGO and activist community but we also talk to our government relations specialists and we understand from our communications team and others what a situation might look like in a particular country. So as we're crafting these policies, we are doing it in a methodical, thoughtful way and trying to make sure that we are crafting, crafting rules that allow people to speak freely but also ensure the safety of everybody on the site. And she gives an interesting example. We saw a page that was in response to the kidnapping of uh, the three young men in Israel. And the page had speech on it that said, uh, we should kill a terrorist. And we did get some inquiries about this page. Why were we allowing this page? Was this page hate speech? So in this case, we looked and said, this is not targeting Palestinians. This is speech that is about terrorist. We didn't find it to be particularly credible or sort of general. This is, everybody ought to think about this when we think about this kidnapping. So we decided to leave the speech up. But what if you disagree with that judgment? There's no appeal to a higher court or elected parliament as there is when challenging a legal judgment or government policy. No wonder Monica Bickett and her counterparts at Google and Twitter have been called the deciders they are making decisions which have a wider impact than any made by a national government or court. That's why I argue that we need a set of basic principles for free speech in a connected world. Principles that we must then fight for, not just in our own countries, but also by holding to account these private superpowers. The first principle is we must be free and able to express ourselves and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas regardless of frontiers. Of course, the Chinese Communist Party profoundly disagrees. At the beginning of this century, President Bill Clinton declared that for China to try to control the Internet would be like nailing jello to the wall. China's communist rulers turned round and said, just watch us. The jury is still out, of course, and I think the attempt will fail in the end. But at the moment, they're making a pretty good stab at nailing jello to China's great internet firewall. The other principles then cover crucial areas for free speech, such as the pursuit of knowledge, standards for journalism, religion, privacy, and official secrecy. Across all these areas, I detect several major threats to free speech. The first is what I call the assassin's veto. Here, the all-too-believable threat is, if you say that, we will kill you. Many of us woke up to this for the first time with the Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa on the novelist Salman Rushdie in 1989. Last year, we saw the terrible murder of journalists working for the French magazine Charlie Hebdo because they had dared to publish cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad.
In recent times, the assassin's veto has all too often been exercised in the name of Islam. But it's important to stress that the generic evil is using the threat of violence to curb speech for whatever reason. Thus, for example, the brave Italian journalist Roberto Saviano is forced to live in hiding under armed guard because he wrote a book exposing the mafia. It's a horrible life that he's condemned to, shuttling from safe house to safe house. È qualcosa che ha messo la vita delle persone a cui voglio molto bene in grande difficoltà. It's something that has made the lives of the people I love very difficult. This is hard to bear. Of course, I defend the words I wrote. I don't want them to win. But I feel the sort of worry you feel when you're under pressure. It's not so much the life of an author, but more the life of a crusader. The guiding principle I propose here is we neither make threats of violence nor accept violent intimidation. Every time we retreat in the face of intimidation, and that happens much too often, we actually encourage fanatics to use the assassin's veto. Another threat is what free speech scholars call the heckler's veto. If enough people shout loudly enough, they stop the speaker from being heard. A good example is the protest by crowds of Sikhs against the staging in Birmingham of a play called Beshti which portrayed sexual abuse in a Sikh temple. We've asked them very, very nicely, very politely, diplomatically, that we want changes made to that play. We don't mind if you set that play in a, in a community center, take it outside the Gurdwara. We don't want you doing a play about a Sikh Gurdwara which you don't know nothing about. The local police advised the playwright to leave the city, and the theater canceled the performance. The heckler's veto had prevailed. Then there's what is almost a disease of our time, the offensiveness veto. In 17th century Poland, any member of the gentry could stop a piece of proposed legislation simply by shouting, I don't allow it. This was called the liberum veto. Not one man, one vote, but one man, one veto. Our contemporary version is people trying to prevent other people saying things they don't like by crying, I'm offended. It's particularly effective when the protester claims to speak on behalf of some offended group, religious, ethnic, sexual or social. Now, in some circumstances, speech can certainly cause harm. Words and images are powerful. But we must always distinguish between a genuine demonstrable harm and a purely subjective taking offence. A society that allows anyone to shut other people up simply by making the veto statement, I'm offended, will end up suffocating free speech. In the next four programmes, I'll be examining the state of free speech in our universities, the media, the tension between religion and free speech, and the chilling effect of our dramatic loss of privacy. I've got Timothy Garton-Ash on Free Speech. The producer was Nina Robinson.